This conference will now be recorded. Welcome everybody to today's ACRM Pandemic Task Force webinar series. Um, today we have a special guest speaker, Matt Erb, who will speak about complementary and integrative care, rehabilitation technology, and challenging times. Um, they, I, a little bit of housekeeping to begin with. First, um, everyone, if you could put your cameras, you know, go make them go dark and also put your microphones on mute. That would be great and much appreciated. Also, as we go along with our presentation, um, please post comments and questions in the chat window in the GoToMeeting uh, environment, and uh, we will uh, talk about those uh, as time allows at the end of the presentation. And so thanks so much for joining us. I also wanted to note that this is uh, this comes to us as a collaboration with the Complementary Integrative Rehabilitation Medicine Networking Group within ACRM, and we very much appreciate that collaboration. Um, so uh, today's presentation, again, is Complementary and Integrative Care, Rehabilitation, Technology, and Challenging Times. Our presenter is Matt Erb. Matt Erb is a physical therapist originally trained at the University of Iowa and currently based in Tucson, Arizona. He is a senior faculty member, clinical supervisor, and a clinical program lead for the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. He has a clinical practice with Simons Physical Therapy in Tucson, Arizona, focusing on mind-body integrated care. Matt is also founder of, of Embody Your Mind, specializing in high-quality writing, teaching, and consulting in integrative and mind-body medicine topics. Matt is also an instructor for the Andrew Wheel Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. And additionally, Matt regularly teaches for the University of Arizona's physician training programs. He is motivated to find and promote better ways for delivering whole person healthcare. Matt, welcome. Thank you, John. Um, it's great to be here and to share this time with you. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I, I would like to start just by saying that uh, my heart is with everyone during these challenging times. I know that these uh, times are affecting everyone in different ways, um, but my sense is that everyone is touched or impacted in some way, um, that what's happening is unprecedented. So I just want to acknowledge that I'm breathing with you and uh, have my heart open to everyone who's impacted during these times. And just uh, um, putting up my disclosure slide here as we get out of the gates, um, I've disclosed that I do have a financial interest in a teaching and consulting business. Today we're going to talk about um, the need, the challenges, and the opportunities of telehealth, but in relationship to um, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as uh, the landscape of uh, evidence-based uh, integrative rehabilitation medicine. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the relevance of stress as influential to navigating um, health and disease processes in general, but particularly during this time. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the relevance of specific um, integrative practices and the support of well-being during these times. I'll offer you a little taste of how you can uh, weave in some evidence-based mind-body, integrative mind-body practices into the virtual forum, into your telehealth. Uh, so we'll do an experiential and talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, tips uh, that um, can be useful for enhancing the delivery of complementary and integrative uh, rehabilitation practices via the telehealth forum. I understand there's already been a um, a whole series of uh, presentations about the logistics of telehealth um, as people have sort of scrambled to continue to meet the needs uh, of clients and patients during these times. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, and John already spoke to this, but um, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine uh, has a um, networking group, uh, CIRM networking group. Uh, it's devoted to the evidence uh, basis of complementary and integrative rehab medicine. And one of the things that I really like to mention to people is that um, sometimes there is a, uh, a polarization that comes from duality, the tendency to see things as either or, it's either biomedical or it's uh, integrative or complementary. Um, 
And the both and approach is, is how I experience it, is that they these seemingly different models are not all so different, that they actually can blend and work very well together, which is where I, I, I tend to only use the word integrated, but the word complementary suggests that they complement each other. And, and, and so moving away from this polarization is really encouraged. And that's one of the efforts of uh, our networking group. Um, and we are starting our own new webinar series. So I just want to put a plug in for that coming up in May on May 14th. Uh, Arlene Schmidt is an OT researcher, uh, Colorado State University, who studies yoga therapeutics and stroke and stroke rehabilitation. So she'll be our first presenter for our own series. So be sure to tune in then. And I wanted to say a little bit, there's so many different words uh, and phrases out there, telehealth, telemedicine, telerehab, tele-OT, tele-PT. Um, and semantics uh, aside, uh, I'd, I'd like to look at the idea that um, COVID-19 is undoubtedly uh, a major stressor. Uh, there, it's bringing about many challenges in our world and in our lives. And it's also important for us to look for the upside. Uh, one of the things that we teach about in mind-body medicine is that we're hardwired for uh, for negativity bias. Um, this is very much survival-oriented, and this can translate into our uh, cognitive structures as well. Um, and so it's inviting to see uh, and acknowledge, yes, these are trying times, um, and to have our hearts open to the suffering that's occurring, and also to see the opportunities that it might be presenting. And I see the the whole landscape of virtual care uh, is one of those. It helps us to balance the uh, the challenges that we're navigating with a focus on discovering these upsides. And so despite that I'm going to offer some insight into how I'm working with telehealth, uh, including in, in the delivery of integrative health practices, uh, what I might suggest is that um, you can engage your own uh, creativity to see how you can uh, meet these times um uh with these upside looks and and to get your creative juices flowing in terms of integrative care uh, delivery via telehealth I, I think there's different uh, sort of forums uh, i've been noticing that there's a lot of large group programs going on uh, where people are offering uh, large-scale yoga classes for example large-scale meditation classes where uh, many, many people can call in. I am also uh, want to call attention to the potential benefit during these times of offering small group forums. Uh, we'll talk about why that is, but in, in my work with uh, um, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, which is a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., we're offering free, um, during this time, free online groups uh, based on a small group model of self-care. Um, but that's also built on the idea of connecting with others, having a space uh, to connect with others and to see ourselves in the eyes of others. And so small group offerings is an excellent forum. And then, of course, your individual uh, care. If you're trying to transition your uh, medical or rehab practice um, online, that we have these one-to-one -one care transitions. Um, and of course, I know you've already covered all the details of uh, policy and different state regulations and so on um, in prior sessions. So I won't go into that, but just to, uh, acknowledging that there's all these different ways in which um, uh, you can deliver uh, integrative practices. Now, I want to shift gears just a little bit here uh, to talk about a background science. Um, this first image um, is built on the idea of uh, integral lens on body, mind, and environment, that we have a whole system state and there's continuous interactions uh, intra-individual within myself and my own mind-body processes, but also inter-individual and in relationship to the environments that we're navigating. And when we look at the science uh, of mind-body medicine, uh, when we look at the science of psychoneuroendoimmunology, and I think of Candace Pert, who was a pioneer in psychopharmacology. She was one of the original researchers who discovered the mu receptor, and she was a longtime um, 
advocate for uh, psychoneuroimmunology, and she said, well, technically, we could continue to add other subdisciplines into one extended long word to convey the sort of integral lens that everything is in continuous uh, interdependence uh, physiologically uh, within and between. So we can see changes in neurochemistry, altered autonomic activity, impact on neuroendocrine processes, uh, breakdown of facilitatory and inhibitory nociceptive physiology if we're working with um, uh, persons experiencing pain uh, conditions, uh, breakdown of inflammatory and immune processes. And we've got this in a circle to help sort of convey this notion that this is all uh, in relationship as a whole state. And when we look at the um, second graphic here, uh, I want to bring up the, the topic of stress and allostatic load. This is an image that is modified uh, from a paper on uh, processes of imagery, uh, mental imagery, uh, or guided imagery. And you can see in this graphic that there are central neurophysiological correlates, including limbic system function. Uh, that's an in interaction with autonomic response, um, either stress response, defensive adaptive responses versus relaxation response. Uh, and all day long, we're, as we're navigating our body-mind environment interactions, the system is seeking to return to homeostatic processes. So this central autonomic um, axis. And in this graphic, you can see that we have um, many variables that can be positive, negative inputs, um, like uh, cardiovascular, uh, cardiorespiratory, metabolic, uh, processes of inflammatory and immune, neuroendocrine. So these are very similar, but we're presenting this one in relationship to processes of mental imagery. And I'll be talking a little bit more about imagery, but when we look at um, the mind-body connection, if I begin to um, worry about something that may happen in the future. Um, that's going to be associated with processes of mental imagery. It can engage all of my senses as I, as the mechanism of worry plays out. And one of the things that we'll say in, in studying the science of imagery is that the, in a sense, the body doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. Uh, if I said this in a, in a different way, I, I would quote Mark Twain. Uh, who said, I had a great many problems in my life, most of which never happened. And so we have this continuous um, uh, need for appraisal and reappraisal in ourselves of, uh, of threat appraisal. Uh, is, is it proportional? Is it out of proportion? Um, and how do I sort of mitigate the influence of mind-body processes? Um, and that's where some of these integrative practices, the, the research is quite good on integrative practices such as guided imagery uh, and some of the others that we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, impacting this integral or integrated system look uh, at reducing allostatic load uh, through the mitigation of stress, uh, through the management of anxiety and so on. And that this is all acting in favor of enhancing well-being uh, and or improved uh, health outcomes. When I go to the uh, next slide, this is actually hot off the presses, so I was happy to see this pop up uh, just yesterday, and I added this into the slides. But this is in, a, in a, a journal on complementary therapies in clinical practice. This is actually a randomized controlled trial that was done with 51 participants who were hospitalized in isolation with COVID-19. Uh, the purpose of this study was rec the, the recognition of the healthcare providers that these individuals uh, were experiencing significant anxiety and, and an impact on sleep. And it's, uh, I was just talking with some of my own uh, colleagues uh, this morning about how my own sleep has been disrupted lately. And that uh, poor sleep is actually related to, a, in a sense, challenges with the waking state of the mind and, and and brain and body being in a state of hypervigilance and that that's affecting the ability for the system to come into restorative states of sleep. And so in recognizing this, these researchers um, also recognize that many of the sleep promoting drugs uh, add to respiratory depression, which is not helpful in COVID-19. And they delivered uh, over the hospital call system into the isolation rooms of these patients in a randomized controlled approach, 
a progressive muscle relaxation that involved self-regulation skills training um, to see whether this reduced anxiety and improved sleep training. And in this case, there were statistically significant uh, improvements after intervention in both the sleep quality score and the average anxiety score. So this shows you that it's possible to deliver things in uh, non-traditional forums and still get the effect. One of the other things I'll say before I go to the next slide on this is that in my own um, transition of my um, clinical practice, which is predominantly with patients experiencing chronic pain, as well as comorbid um, uh, psychiatric or mental health challenges like anxiety, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, that people were hesitant. Uh, it's, it's unusual to be thinking, well, how are we going to do what we're doing here remotely? But I had about a third to half of my patients who have taken that leap to give it a try. And just this last week, I had several people who said to me, oh my gosh, this seemed as effective as when I was with you in the clinic. And that was affirmative that this can be done when we have a, an understanding of, of how to do it, as well as the types of tools that lend themselves very well to this form of telehealth. And it's from that point that I would say that many of the integrative practices, and in particular, my, my subspecialty within integrative medicine is, is, is um, a clinical mind-body medicine, evidence-based mind-body medicine, uh, lends itself quite well uh, to this forum. So as I move to the next one, um, I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about aligning um, what you deliver in telehealth to need. Uh, so I already touched on this a bit, but you know, depending upon the lens of which you're looking at this pandemic, uh, the lens that we're looking at it uh, at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, where we have uh, 25 years experience in population-wide trauma relief, where we're going into communities that have had natural disasters or post-war settings, um, communities that are impacted by high levels of historical trauma, for example. Uh, I think it's fair to say that this pandemic event, one of the, uh, ac beyond acute stress, we're also going to be looking at in the aftermath as the acute phase of this um, uh, gets under control and we move forward, that there's going to be a high level of trauma in the aftermath that's going to need to be attended to. Um, so we're, we're really living... Uh, I mentioned uh, to some friends the other day that it feels sometimes when I go out, like to, to um, out of isolation to, to get some groceries or some uh, essentials, that you can palpate in the atmosphere a sense of fear. And I call this a, a fear contagion because I notice in myself how that interacts is that I start to get tense, my shoulders start to tense, my jaw gets tense, I find myself restricting my breathing. And this is, uh, I think, a natural, uh, biologically conditioned response to living with uncertainty. I mentioned earlier, we're hardwired sur for, to survival. And it's also leading us to be very distractible. We've got scattered minds. And so I think we need to make sure that we keep this in mind in terms of uh, uh, the expectations that we have in, in coming into telehealth and how we're meeting people and their needs at this time. And one of the ways to do this is to help uh, to ask people, you know, what's what's happening for you? We need to create a space of not just rushing to fix people's experiences during these times, but to help people identify what's really going on and what do you need? And I put up this graphic from um, acceptance and commitment therapy. And there's, um, by the way, you're going to be seeing some references along the way in parentheses um, that are at the end. But um, one of the acronyms, uh, in act, acceptance and commitment therapy is moving from fear to acting. That we can easily in these times get fused with uh, thoughts. Uh, we can have a negative evaluation of our experience instead of missing the potential for balancing that with the upside, um, with what's right at the same time. And that's a both and lens. Uh, we can get into avoidance of our experience uh, and reason giving for our behaviors um, when we're in the face of stress. And that there's uh, tools like acceptance and commitment therapy, which are increasingly used in integrative uh, rehab practice, for example. A lot of physical therapists and occupational therapists 
as part of breaking down the, the barriers between mind and body or getting trained in ACT and delivering this as part of psychologically integrated rehab practice um, that we have to be addressing mind and body in unison and not separating. And when we deliver these types of practices, you can move towards greater expect, uh, uh, acceptance of our experience uh, and to increase our comfort with discomfort, our ability to be present to what's happening in our lives. Uh, that then allows us to move into choosing a valued direction and taking uh, committed actions. And those committed actions are uh, in the service of what's valuable, vital, and meaningful to us in our lives. And so this is just an example in that, that reference, Berman 2013, that you see underneath that slide, is actually a study on um, internet-delivered acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, so you can take a look at that if you're interested. I'm just giving you some examples of the types of tools and strategies and how we want to be considering if what we're delivering via telehealth is actually tailored to meet uh, the needs and not maybe just focused on uh, what the person's um, primary condition or diagnosis is, but that we're also meeting other uh, needs during these times. So this slide um, moves into uh, what to offer. I think in my observations in the last three weeks of telehealth, uh, as well as doing some group-based work, connecting with people in group forums, there's a great need to share. And we sometimes uh, rush to interventions, we rush into fixing, but that the space for sharing and listening is primarily therapeutic unto itself. And we need to consider spending more time allowing people to talk. Now, depending upon the profession that, that, that you're coming from, uh, some people are hesitant um, to think, well, you know, how do I build for talking and sharing? If we look at the mind-body science of sharing, listening, um, it's actually self-regulating. It's actually regulating neuromuscular tone, for example. And so we sometimes um, miss the fact that the time that's taken to be heard, to be seen, to be validated, to express emotions and fears is therapeutic. That's an intervention unto itself. So we have to increase our valuation of that. At the level of mind-body integration, which I've already been talking about, we do want to provide some support for regulation and resilience. And this can come in many forms. I'm going to do an experiential activity with everyone in just, in just a little bit. Um, that's built off of that, um, but you can include things like mindfulness practices, um, movement, contemplative movement practices in particular. Things like Qigong, Tai Chi, therapeutic yoga have a very solid evidence base because they're engaging uh, multiple levels uh, uh, within the person's awareness that require a neurocognitive um, and brain-body integration to enact. Uh, being able to practice movements in a slow way that attends to breath, body awareness, uh, one's intention for themselves all at the same time, for example. And there's the uh, guided imagery reference. This is an excellent way um, to support people. Um, there uh, is a um, free website accessible online that's through Kaiser Permanente um, that offers podcasts of guided imagery, evidence-based guided imagery for multiple health conditions from insomnia to anxiety to uh, chronic pain management to headache management uh, and so on. And so that, those are examples of resources that we can be passing on to our patients during these times that are um, easily accessible, uh, that require no cost. Um, and, um, and then specialized support. If you're trained in evidence-based integrative medicine, um, you're well, uh, well primed already to be transitioning your, your integrative services into the online forum, uh, tailoring your professional expertise. So these are just examples of things to offer. And what we're gonna do next before we do an experiential is just say a little bit about um, what are some tips for delivering um, these integrative practices via telehealth. My first bullet here says your physiological state matters. And to give you an example of this, I'd like you to just notice right now as I'm talking that I'm slowing down. 
and you might be able to hear a subtle shift in the tone of my voice. Our physiological state is demonstrated through our own physiological parameters. It's conveyed to others in the prosody, which is the rhythm and intonation of your speech. It's conveyed to others if we're on video, and today we're not on video. But I do video sessions with my patients whenever they're open to it and willing. And the facial expressions, leaning into the screen, showing that I'm here with you, I'm attentive, can assist in the co-regulation of the other. And this is a whole new area of research is looking at how your physiological state as a professional is conveyed and impacts the physiological state of the person you're working with. As part of this, your appearance and your environment matter. And again, we're not on video today, but looking at the lighting and presenting your telehealth sessions from a calm environment. Audio and video quality matter. John, who introduced today's session, and I were talking about different uh, microphones and using uh, higher quality microphones that allows uh, a better uh, sense of the person's voice. Uh, and that also allows um, uh, the delivery of music. I often, in my sessions, am, am delivering music. Uh, in a book I'm developing, where uh, I have a music therapist who's writing about uh, ways in which all rehab professionals can introduce music outside of the professional training that would be required to be a music therapist. And music in the environment can have a profound impact on people's physiological state. Thinking about length. Um, and working with each individual that you do telehealth with to, to choose the right length of time. People are under significant demand. Uh, people have kids at home. And so you want to be able to, to work with them. What works with you for the length of this call and not make assumptions about the time that they have available? Uh, mixing up what you offer. Attention spans really appreciate this. I'm often saying, let's just take a minute, and everyone who's listening right now might take a minute Pull your shoulders back, stretch your arms up and out. Do something that shifts the energy a little bit. Shift your body around um, to shake it up as opposed to necessarily thinking that everything needs to be built upon in mind-body medicine. We do do a lot of regulation, relaxation response training because physiological state, if we're in a high tension states, it, it partially dictates uh, the range of behaviors that are accessible to us but I also don't want people to think that the way to regulation is only through relax, um, that it can also be through movement and, and sort of mixing things up. Keeping things simple, relatable and accessible, and approaching it from a, uh, this is lofty language, but from a phenomenological uh, heuristic, which is inviting people to come to know things for themselves, that our job isn't to find the answers for people during these times, but it's to help offer them an experience that lets them come to know what they need for themselves. And our experiential in just a moment will be built off of that. And also a reminder that the choices that people make during stressful times, or in general, not even during stressful times, are subject to the choices available to them. That much of uh, mind-body medicine is focused on supporting self-care. And we know personal responsibility plays a significant role in health, but that can be a luxury for many people based on the, the choices available to them and whether even basic resources are met. And this speaks to the importance that we recognize the relevance of social determinants of health in our delivery of healthcare in general, and particularly in integrative care, which has a risk of becoming uh, sort of a luxury uh, a medicine in a sense. And so, we are a half hour in and we've got just a little bit of time. I'm gonna invite everyone who is on, or if you're listening to this later, to take a moment in your space, wherever you are, if it's possible, um, to settle in to body awareness, to body attention, and just see what you discover. Much of our day keeps our attention, in a sense, in our head, in thinking and thoughts and cognitive level uh, experience. And we sometimes miss the sensate version of that. How is all that's happening landing in the felt sense of the body? 
If it's comfortable for you, you might choose to close your eyes, but that's optional. And I'm just going to invite you into a moment of attention and awareness to the felt sense of your body. You might discover places that are sore and tense and tight. Or, in contrast, you might also notice some places that are relatively loose comfortable and open. A few moments ago, I mentioned that we're all hardwired for survival and that this can translate cognitively into a negativity bias, but that we must also look for what's right with the body too. Are there features that are relatively okay or positive even? And might I find a moment of gratitude for the steady service of the body. Despite any challenges, it is the vehicle via which we experience ourselves in this world. And so taking moments to pause and connect with the felt sense of the body is vital. See what you discover, noticing the face and head, the neck, shoulders and arms, left and right, noticing what you sense in the chest, the cavity of the chest that houses the heart and lungs. It's got a front wall and the front chest, it's got a back wall, it's got a left wall and a right, surrounded by the rib cage. Just seeing what you notice along the way, moving down into the cavity of the abdomen, also bounded by front and back, left and right. Moving further down into the pelvis and the pelvic floor, the connection of the pelvis into your hips, and down each leg, eventually reaching the toes, left, and right. And coalescing all of these parts into a whole sense, a global body feeling, allowing all of your senses to merge together into a uniform felt sense of your body and your being in your current space in the present moment. And from this place of body awareness, Inviting the body, the senses of the body to tell you, is there anything you need for yourself during this time, during this pandemic, related to the pandemic or unrelated to the pandemic and just looking at the ongoing processes of your life? Is my body wishing to communicate something to me? What do I need? What does my self-care look like? Not what someone else is telling me it should be, but what my own sense of it is. And from that question, continuing to notice the felt sense of the body and also connecting with your breath, connecting with the powerful rhythms of your breath similar to the suggestion that our voices can convey our physiological state, our body, muscles and joints will convey it, our movements and postures, so will our breath. And so attention on the breath allows us to reflect on what is the energy of my physiological state. Is it fast or slow? Is it tense or soft? Is it high or low? Just a general sense of the quality the speed of the energy in your system and how is that conveyed in the breath and do you wish to influence it? Just bringing attention to your breath allows and affords a natural regulating response, but you might go a little further and choose to soften your breath, to lengthen it a bit, particularly the exhale. In heart rate variability biofeedback, lengthening our exhales gently, gradually can increase vagal response, the parasympathetic action, a slowing 
of the heart rate on the each exhale. You might, if it feels right to you, even deepen your breath. Whatever qualities would serve you in this moment, So taking another breath or two in awareness. And at the end of an exhale, bringing your attention back. If I were interacting more directly with people, I'd be asking, what was that like? Share with me. Positives or negatives are welcome. Someone might say, you know, that was really hard for me. I had a tr trouble slowing down. I, I almost felt a little more anxious. Yeah, okay, tell me more about that. And someone else might say, wow, I found that very calming. The point is not to have an expected outcome from it, but to work with whatever the person's experience is and let that be a forum for further exploration. So it's very much a process-oriented way of working with these mind-body skills. So that gives you a little bit of a sense uh, of how I might deliver an experiential training. In my profession, physical therapy, this would be neuromuscular re-education. The evidence is very strong of central brain body influence from these types of practices. Uh, there's a neurocognitive effect which can influence top-down pathways, inhibitory pathways, for example, on uh, nociception, pain processes, uh, but uh, uh, emotion regulation, neuromuscular tension, and so on. Thinking back to my earlier graphics. So that is what I wanted to present. And we are, I'm just checking the time, about 40 minutes in here. Um, I'm not sure if we have any questions, but I will um, turn this back over to John to see if we have any questions that we could explore. This is Mia. I found this picture online, and I absolutely love this picture of this dog, Mia, um, raising her hand to ask a question. So thank you, everyone, for, for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions. Super. Thank you, Matt. Wow, that was really powerful. Uh, maybe you could come back every week and just do that. Uh, yes. Um, Benefit so from it. Yeah, very, very helpful. Well, so we do have one question, but I'm going to indulge my powers as moderator and, and ask a, kind of a, a, the first question and, and kind of a bit more abstract question, which is earlier on and throughout, you said that we're hardwired for survival. And originally, I took that as kind of a negative thing that, you know, survival means, you know, tensing up and being on guard and hyper vigilant, etc. And your presentation, though, seemed to suggest maybe we are also hardwired for, you know, balance, equanimity, uh, stability. Um, I know it's an abstract question, but I was wondering if maybe you might want to just comment on that quickly. Yeah, uh, it's a great point. Um, I guess I would say it's it's maybe not so much abstract that. Um, I think both both are true. I think that there is a neuroscientific basis for both. Um, the first part of my answer is that I I encourage people to look at the fact that we are hardwired for survival as a positive. Um, this is particularly important in our work with uh, individuals who have experienced trauma. That when we're experiencing trauma, it the sort of adaptive defensive biology can respond through different strategies so those that have studied mind body medicine will be familiar with the term fight flight freeze some of these um, uh, biological responses that are defensive they're, they're adaptive they're designed uh, to promote survival uh, and my stance on this is wow thank you i'm so glad this is built into my system I want you to come online when I need you, but if I'm outside of emergent conditions and circumstances, that's when neurocognitive, the cognitive level might say, thank you, but no thank you. Your services aren't so needed today. Stand down. Um, uh, and, and if we have experienced something traumatic, we can. it's very much helpful for uh, shame resiliency to understand 
if our system responded to a traumatic event like a car accident through a freeze response, for example, which in some senses could be expected because we can't really fight or flee a car accident, that that was necessary and protective and defensive. So thank you for that. And, and that it wasn't a weakness that if I've experienced something traumatic, that this is not a, a bad thing. And at the same time, uh, because of the way that we could look at the translation of these biological underpinnings to stress response and survival into cognitive levels, that I think we do have a tendency to focus on what's, what's uh, off or wrong in, in our experience or environment. And that does need a more conscious challenging uh, to redirect us towards connecting with uh, purpose and meaning and gratitude, the possibility of equanimity, like you said, that we can begin to look at our thoughts as opposed to looking at our life through them as a filter on the lens. So there's a distinct difference between looking at the thoughts and going, huh, that's an interesting thought. Why is the mind producing that one? As opposed to um, being able to sort of um, allow it to end up becoming a filter via which we're actually experiencing the reality through that thought as a lens on our experience. So that that's something from acceptance and commitment therapy, but um, I'm not sure if I got, the, got to the heart of your question, but there's a both and for me in this, and, and we need to be uh, acknowledging the, the normalcy of the, um, the survival aspects, uh, having compassion for those aspects, and then actively working to, not because we're avoiding that, but actively working as a both and. We also have this upside and that we want to give attention to it. Great. Then I guess there's an either or in this case as well, as in addition to the either or that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation regarding the sort of the physical self and the mind, mind body self, if you will. Um, thank you. So we have a question from Caitlin. The question is, what additional resources can you recommend for seeking continuing education on this topic, ways to incorporate CIRM in our clinical practice? And then parenthetically, Caitlin notes, I'm a neuro rehab OT who sees frequent mental health comorbidities with stroke and other neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunities out there. There's a growing number of opportunities. Uh, just today, I've mentioned uh, individual modalities like uh, mental imagery, uh, mindfulness trainings, um, uh, contemplative movement practices. Um, these all have a solid foundation, uh, existing foundation, and there's multiple uh, forums for getting trained in these areas. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy, for example. Um, there's a growing number of courses being offered specifically for that. Um, I teach for the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, which I mentioned earlier. We have training programs available on a wide range of these tools, and particularly in relationship to people wanting to do small group work, uh, which is an area of emphasis in our area as well. So there's lots of resources. I'm happy to try to tailor it to your needs. If you want to reach out to me, I'll have my email up at the end um, to see if, if I could understand your specific needs, what your training already has accomplished in this area and, and what areas you're interested in, and then could maybe give you some additional ideas. But there's a lot out there. You just got to start to begin to look for it and encourage you, um, if you're not already a part of our networking group, our CRM networking group, uh, there's a lot of uh, individuals in that um, who could offer additional input as well. It's, it's a wonderful forum um, for us to, to network and share our, our learning opportunities and resources. Great. Thank you, Matt. And we have a question from Mary Lou. Firstly, thank you so much, Matt, for this lovely presentation and, and experiential process. Question, there are so many resources offered in various realms. Our patients are exploring and ask, and ask for recommendations how best to guide them. One individual is stressed by so many stress management classes online, how best to respond to that? So you know, the, the, the offerings on stress management are causing stress. Um, any guidance on, on sort of how to navigate the, the wealth of information out there? Yeah, um, this is, I, I'm right there with you, Mary Lou. This is a, a reality. I've been noticing this myself at how many things have flooded my 
social media, many, many people wanting to help, offering different forums. Um, if I were working individually with someone who's experiencing this, um, I, I would first focus on supporting them into a quieter, calmer state, similar to the guided meditation I just did. I think that when we can get in touch with the felt sense of our body, perhaps have even a few minutes of slowing our breath down, that we can listen to that felt sense. We can tune into our bodily sensation. You know, we have this language of, I've got a gut feeling about this. But I think when the energies are so fast and busy and distractible, it's much harder for us to get in touch and to sink down into that uh, felt sense. So I'm apt to encourage people to start to work just with some very basic body awareness and have them present the question, okay, I, I, I've heard that there's this app and this program and this one, and sort of in a sense, ask the body to tell you what feels right at this time. Um, it can be, it can add to the, the paradox of some of this is that it can add to the overwhelm that people are experiencing um, to add in, you know, our, our center is offering these two hour groups weekly for eight weeks. It's a free program, but that's not going to be workable for many people. Some people don't have two hours and I would want that answer to come from their own intuitive felt sense but then I have to help them connect with that. And, and for me, the way to connect people into getting to that answer is getting back into the body and, and listening to and trusting the, their own uh, felt sense and making the decision as to where do I want to put my energy and resource. If we, if we had a better, okay, so I, I see the comment come up. Uh, perfect, thanks again. It's gonna say, I, I'd love to hear your answer, Mary Lou. So, okay, great. Well, thank you, Matt. And so an, another question then um, is about constraints on, on the therapist or the provider. Um, what if the therapist or provider does not have a lot of experience in these integrative tools, um, and, but, all, but at the same time see that they could be useful in their own telehealth sessions and their own practice? And then the other constraint is time. So if I'm a PT or an OT or a speech therapist and I'm I'm working with someone and we have other specific goals. How can I weave in some of these tools and practices um, into, into that session and make it all happen <laughs> within the time constraints? Right. Um, I may repeat just a little bit here, but I think that a space to share that you prioritize giving people a little extra time and in, in, in placing the invitation how are these times impacting you it's really important that we have a chance to talk about that so sometimes i'll even say you know i start out my sessions and say boy there's a lot going on in our world and i'm it's affecting people in, in different ways and we're all sort of relating to it differently but i'm really curious how how is it impacting you so that's something very simple is just building it into to what we typically call subjectivity or um a colleague and uh, of of mine and I are calling it the relational space um, to, to bring that in, so prioritizing that. Uh, I do think that, that the breath, just to, uh, awareness of the breath and body, uh, when people are checking in, when you first meet with them in a session, just uh, the invitation into awareness. I'm just curious what you notice happening in your body right now. What do you notice in your breathing pattern? Uh, sometimes I'll just make an invitation. Would it be okay for us to just breathe together uh, for a moment? Because we know that breathing can help to regulate um, some of the stress systems between our brain and body. And so I'm wondering if you'd be open to an experiment that we just practice a breathing exercise for a few minutes. Uh, and, and usually the best way is not a directive breathing exercise because trying to get people to direct their breath may have a paradoxical anxiety producing effect. So it might just be, let's just notice our breathing for the next minute and what it's like to shift our awareness out of thoughts and just to observe the breath and see, see what, what that's like. Would that be okay? And see, see how the person responds. So I think that that's, that's an avenue. Sometimes it's steering people towards resources if they're wanting them. Would you like some resources on some stress 
management or some mind body skills so you could refer someone to to guided imagery to listen to at bedtime if they're having a lot of of anxiety or insomnia or chronic pain during this time and that's a free resource i mentioned um, it's available online you can you can google guide, guided imagery podcasts or guided imagery kaiser permanente has bell ruth napper stack she's a uh, pioneer in in guided imagery um uh, has a lot of those um condition specific titles available for free, free access. So you can be recommending that people build this into their self-management and home program uh, by giving them resources. Uh, and then, you know, I, I don't know the name, but the occupational therapist uh, earlier who asked about continuing education, this might be an ideal time to, to, to expand your, your reach by uh, looking into some of the training options um, uh, to start to build that skill set. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, and we have another question from R Ramona. Fantastic presentation. I work with brain injured individuals. Any suggestions on how to approach? Yeah, great question. Um, much of this I would have to defer to your expertise in terms of uh, how severe the brain injury is, uh, what their current uh, capacity is, uh, for example, if there's uh, a cognitive impact. Um, and so it's, it really has to be tailored to meet the person's needs. Um, so I, I think it's hard to give general recommendations knowing that traumatic brain injuries um, occur on a, on a very wide spectrum. Um, yeah, so I, it, it's a little hard, hard for me to, to be more specific than that. I do think that these tools can be very accessible um, you know, I talked about the, uh, our group's upcoming webinar uh, in May on Arlene Schmid's, uh, Dr. Schmid's work on uh, the use of yoga in, in stroke rehab. Um, uh, and, and so it can be done. It's just a matter of identifying which facets are, are um, best suited for the person at, at any given time. And without making assumptions, too, I think sometimes we make assumptions. So we do have to have adaptability and flexibility, a willingness to go into working with people uh, through the lens of um, creativity and experimenting. We don't always know for sure, um, but if we make an assumption that someone's capacity would prohibit them from having an experience, it may actually be more profoundly impactful than we realize if, 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 if we don't give them the opportunity. Super, thanks. And um, another question here is, um, it's commonly said, you know, PTs are known to say, if I'm not touching the person, I'm not delivering therapy. And how, you know, to, how could you address the concerns possibly from PTs that telehealth um, and particularly the sort of integrative medicine might simply turn into a talking session? Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, so first I want to mention that uh, touch is, is vital in our lives, uh, both in our personal lives, but also at the professional level. There's a significant role uh, and value in touch. It can be very nurturing. I often talk about the biology of nurturance and that there's value in that. But we also need to provide people with experiences that are equally nurturing as they are empowering and active therapy, exercise, movement. Uh, self-care skills, self-regulation, many of these mind-body skills uh, enhance self-efficacy. Um, and so it's a great time, even, even when we can't uh, be doing hands-on therapies or, or depending upon your setting, uh, being uh, in person in the clinic, it's a great time to realize that there's a, a significant amount that can happen for people outside of touch. And this challenges both the therapist and the patients to um, look at their relationship to passive therapies as well, because um, it may bring better balance and con contact context perspective into the utilization of, of more passive modalities and therapies. Um, and again, that doesn't negate the value of it. Uh, and if I were in clinic with people, I, I do some touch-based uh, therapies with people, and I often combine it with the, the, the active mind-body learning, like acceptance and commitment therapy training or um, body awareness training or other facets of yoga, for example, even as I'm doing a touch-based therapy. So think both and, but this is a great opportunity to, to expand your capacity for the more empowering active 
approaches that don't require a reliance upon uh, manual or passive therapies. Super, thanks, Matt. And I guess uh, one last question, um, it's a, and it's about the more active sort of interventions delivered via telehealth and yoga and Qigong in particular. How do you assure safety from that, from like a remote perspective when you're teaching yoga or Qigong uh, via a telehealth uh, platform? Yeah, so I think that your understanding of their current uh, capacity is important. Um, whenever possible, having people connected via video so you can see the environment, the physical environment that they're actually embedded within. Um, making sure that they stay on camera if at all possible. But I discuss safety. If I'm going to be doing movement practices, I talk about, based on my current understanding of, of, of their physical capacity, um, that if we're going to go off camera, if I'm going to be instructing something and you're going to step to the side, um, do you feel safe? Is your balance good? You're going to keep your eyes open, uh, keep your speaker on so that I can, so that you can immediately tell me if there's something unpleasant occurring, uh, if, you're, if your balance feels off. I'll often have people stand near a chair, a wall, a desk, um, so that they have something to immediately contact if I'm doing movement-based or physical practices. And so it's it's having the discussion, it's naming it, it's also being sure that you're um, getting as much information about their physical space, their capacity. And this comes back to your clinical skill, choosing experiences that you know are uh, within the, um, uh, I guess that fit the, their clinical needs based on their diagnosis, their their your, the evaluation that you've completed of them and so on. All right, are you still there? Sounds like we might have lost audio. I can hear you clearly, um, Matt. Okay. So I think we're approaching the top of the hour. Um, 1057. So I think that's probably a good time to wrap up. I'm not sure if we lost John's audio here, but I appreciate um, your tuning in. Uh, please let other people know that um, this is available. Uh, Terry, if you're still on, is this going to be recorded and available for viewing later on for people if they'd like to watch it? Yes, the recording will be downloaded shortly and um, uploaded to the web page by the end of the day. If there are any questions um, or any um, details, um, please check back to the web page. I'm going to put that right up for you. Um, there we go. Look at the bottom of this slide and you can see um, the link to the web page. The PDF of the slides will be posted later today. And um, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you um, Matt, for sharing your expertise with us. Yeah, you're welcome. And on the slide, I'm not sure if I uh, my slides were still up um, towards the end, but there is an email address there, embodyyourmind at gmail.com if you want to reach out to me. Um, and the references were also on the second to last slide for those that want to do a little extra reading in some of these areas. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank I saw my audio. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Bye-bye.